Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are back, the Justice Crew, with another um, mini episode, mini analysis of the P. Diddy Cassie situation. So let me just say thank you to everyone who jumped into the comments last time. Uh, we appreciate the response and to know that our voices are valuable on this topic. One of the things I said to Margo was for Margo as a longtime DV advocate and law professor who taught a clinic all around these issues. And again, for me as someone who has survived a toxic and abusive relationship, I think we just have an analysis here um, that hopefully kind of supports survivors but also um, supports our community. Yeah, and just so you know, this is something we learned in the last one. We're going to be using DVSA in the R word for the issues that we're talking about so that the algorithm doesn't cut us off. And also, if it provides a trigger to someone actually hearing those words, we hope by abbreviating them, again, we are supporting survivors. Absolutely, because we always want to come from a, a survivor-centered lens and that feedback is very, very valuable to us. Okay, so let's get into it. Yeah. Last week, we talked a little bit about the lawsuit, um, the fact that she settled. We talked about the Adult Survivors Act and how it was sunsetting or expiring on November 24th, which is the reason that so many celebrities and cases have come into the media just last week. But I think it's really important because there has not been much conversation about this, Tashira, about what has Cassie's life been like and how has she been okay? Yeah, so I was in a relationship that was very toxic and abusive for a much shorter period of time than Cassie. And I remembered the moment, Margo, and we knew each other then. We weren't as close, but we knew each other well, uh, where I was at a work conference and I like went to a mirror because I could not stop crying. And I was like checking my face to make sure there weren't signs of that. And I just looked at myself and was like, you have got to get out of this situation. And what I told myself at that time and people, um, whatever it takes, I would say to leave an abuser. But what got me out of my situation was saying to myself, you have people who are looking up to you and particularly my sisters and you have to make them proud. And so I took the responsibility of being the eldest as my call to heal. I don't know what her call to heal has been, but Suffering the kind of abuse that she has, I could only imagine. My situation was some physical, but much more mental and emotional. I would be isolated. I wouldn't be spoken to for weeks at a time. Um, if I made him really upset, he would throw all of my things outside. That happened three times. And I remember after it happened the first time and I went back, someone that I knew from the community that we were a part of was like, you went back? You know, and over the years, people have said things to me like, well, do you think you're just a weak person? Blaming me for my abuse. And so I can only imagine how she's had to contend with that as well, because I'm sure you've seen this with many of your clients, Margot. It can be hard to leave, not just because of the control and the coercion that's in, at play, but also how the people around you have seen your victimization and how you're fearful of how they might treat you. Yeah, so Tashara, thank you for sharing. Um, I know that it's it's not required that you always share. Um, but I think your story highlights something that is is very um common, which is how hard it is to leave an abusive situation. So it's hard to leave an abusive situation because it's dangerous often. Um, and there are other issues pulling you back, like how, where are you gonna go? How are you gonna afford it? who's going to believe you, that sort of thing. But the data shows that it takes between seven and nine times of actually leaving a relationship, yeah, to to free yourself. And in situations like Cassie, where, we, where we've learned that there was a lot of coercion, there was a lot of SA, there was a lot of um, substance use or su coercive substance use, um, that seven to nine times feels very relevant. Also, that time of separation, and I think the, the Cassie story plays this out too, of uh, that period of separation is often the most lethal time mm -hmm. in an abusive relationship. 
Um, and you can understand why, right? Because we talked about it, how it's all about power and control. You leave that situation, you're reclaiming your power. What is that abuser going to do to reclaim their power? And oftentimes that can be very dangerous and highly lethal. We saw that in some of the facts that Cassie shared in the lawsuit around her R word in 2018. Um, which was significantly after, based on my understanding, they had split up. And he, uh, for folks who don't know, allegedly broke into her home and R-worded her. Um, and Margo made a really good point last time. And for folks who said, well, why didn't she just go to the police? Um, number one, as we learned from Margo as a longtime advocate, very few of these cases actually end up with criminal charges, let alone convictions, but also when you are in a relationship or have been with someone, it can be even more difficult, not to mention just the fear that I'm sure she had. Yeah. And who's going to believe her, right? Like not only was she controlled by him through their romantic relationship, he was controlling her professional relationship. He was controlling who was around her. So we just learned today of a situation um, which someone had met Cassie and the people around Cassie that Diddy was paying for told this person not to speak to her. Yeah. And, right. and we heard that firsthand from someone. Right. Hand. And so, again, aligning with everything we know about isolation, power, and kind of using this person, she is a human being, as a pawn, controlling her behavior, controlling her actions. Well, I mean, that's the patriarchy, right? So we're not surprised by that, that women historically have been treated as pawns, just like um, pick us up and take us from place to place with no concern or care about our feelings. Which gets us to the next point that's something you told me about, speaking of treating a person like a thing. Stop. Yes. So according to Kim Pyre, which is a celebrity news channel that I watch, he reported on um, a doctor who had the experience and interaction with Diddy and Cassie. Specifically, this doctor performed breast augmentation, so implants on Cassie while they were together. And he, Diddy, he did not like the way that the implants looked and forced the doctor. And I mean... Who knows what force actually looked like? Force the doctor to go back in and to redo the surgery. I think it was like a week, maybe two weeks after it had been done. Whatever time period it was, it was much, much, much less than what it takes to heal from that kind of surgery. So as someone who's had two, well, I've actually had three breast surgeries. I've had a double mastectomy and then I had... Um, a reconstruction, which were implants. And then this past October, so about a month and a half ago, I had revision surgery, which was, um, if, if I had breast tissue, which I don't, it would be considered an augmentation um, because they changed the size a little bit based on how my body healed. And I can tell you from each of those surgeries, not only is your body not healed a week after surgery, how your body looks a week after surgery is actually not how it's going to look after you heal because there's so much inflammation post-surgery and it is not safe. So I am not a doctor. This is not medical advice, but based on what I learned about my own body is that your body like grows this capsule around the implant to keep it safe and to keep your body safe. Hopefully some people, I mean, so there is, a lot of people do um, struggle with what's called bre breast implant disease. So if your body um, has some sort of a reaction or allergic reaction to the breast implant, your body does try to protect you from that by growing this like natural sheath around the implant. But that that takes time. Yes. And so like the so there's so many elements of this story that are disturbing to me. One, I have a really hard time as an advocate. I mean, as a feminist, when men are dictating how women's bodies should look. Mm -hmm. So without commenting on other people's relationships, I do have some sus suspicion when men are paying for women's plastic surgery or reconstruction, even because are people doing that because they want to, or are they doing it because of the male gaze that they feel like they need to look a certain way? But 
we know that Diddy was paying for it. Yeah. And I mean, and so did she even want to do this? And the way that it was reported by Kempire was that she was being forced to have the surgery from the beginning, uh, which is not hard to believe if someone then demands that the implants be like redone. Um, the doctor has passed away, so cannot confirm or deny, but there are reports that someone who worked in the office took the social media to confirm this. And he's not the first person. Other people, including one of Diddy's um, former staff people, I think a bodyguard has also taken the social media to confirm Cassie's report. So if you are self-selecting and watching this video, we don't think that you are the people that need to be convinced that this all happened and to hashtag stand with survivors. But I think that it just goes back to the ways in which people around you become complicit to your abuse or begin to blame you for your abuse. And when that happens, it protects and shields the abuser as far as their behavior is concerned and accountability. The last thing I'll say on that point too, Margot, is that for folks who were saying, why didn't she just call the police? I think there is often this misconception that number one, the police are going to do anything. Or number two, when you love someone, even if they're harming you, you want the police to get involved, especially when the assailant is a black man. You don't want the police to get involved. No, of course no. not. <laughs> At fucking. You want the person to stop harming you. And it's as simple as that. And I don't know what planet people who are saying that live on, but the last time I checked, Officer Friendly didn't come to my neighborhood. I saw much more harm being done by police than other people. And so I think this natural fear that people of color, especially black and brown people have, and the suspicion against law enforcement, I don't know the data around it, Margo, but I would assume that would play into like victims and how we respond when we are victims of intimate partner violence. For sure. I think there's an element of that writ large when it, what, uh, for communities of color. I also think that in this case, there's, there's, I, I just, I mean, I don't know, but I, I can imagine that Diddy convinced her that even if she did try to leave or did try to call the police, that no one would believe her. Yeah. Yeah. You're just in it for money. You don't have. And the this very real thing that you mentioned that when you are in an abusive relationship, even if you want to get out, even if you want the relationship to end, you don't want that person necessarily to go to jail. No. I just want, want them to stop harming you. And also because, Marco, they have convinced you that it was your fault. I used to say things like, well, I'm not perfect because I had been convinced that I did something. I, I remember when you would say stuff. Right. I was being convinced and brainwashed and conditioned into the belief that it was my fault. Yeah. And, and so I, I think that expectation is unrealistic and highly problematic. I think so getting to the, yes, com completely. The other thing that and I don't want to pry too much into her life because I hope she's like finding peace and healing through this journey, which I know is not like a one and done thing. Like she'll be healing the rest of her life. And she's had a very busy couple of years because what I have learned is that in the last couple of years, so the last kind of date date we have from the lawsuit with Diddy is 2018, but she has had two children um, since the end of that relationship. And she moved on with a man who she had a baby with, then married, and then now they have a, a second child together, um, who was her personal trainer paid for by Diddy. So I want to talk about this because there's a lot of ways to like analyze this and we don't, I don't want to get into the gossipy side, yep. but I do want to talk about, so there's so many elements, right? Right. Like he like paid for a personal trainer. He wanted her body to look a certain way. Um, and and someone was working for him, but serving her. So there's that interesting dynamic. Like what type of control did he have over this man? But when you think about abusive relationships and the isolation that you talked about, right? There are very few places that victims can go yep. to and feel safe. And so in my work, we saw many, many victims feeling safer in medical appointments. So we did a lot of advocacy and intervention work at community health centers, right? Because 
those were places sometimes that abusers allowed people to allow their victims to go on their own, mm. meet with their doctor, yeah, meet with the nurse, meet whatever, meet with their dentist, right? Um, not always, but sometimes. And you can see in this situation, like maybe he was the only person she, or one of the only people she was able to see on his own, on her own. And I'm so happy you brought this up, Em, because I also think this is a reminder for those of us who have family members or friends who are in these kinds of situations about what it means to su truly support them to get out. And maybe it's not you being the conduit, but maybe it's being in relationship with someone who they are in relationship with to help and to support them. Because I remember my abuser saying to me one time, I had one of those seven to nine times that you just quoted statistically that I got now, I went back and I had built, began to build a life. I'm a social person. I had made friends. We were going out. We were having a good time. And I remember trying to keep those relationships while he and I were back together. And he said to me one day, who are those people that you're hanging out with? I mean, I don't even know them. As if he had to know the people that were my friends, right? And anyone that was not a part of this very small group, he always had something negative to say about. Um, and if they did not kind of come and submit to his will in this very specific way, then they must be doing something wrong and therefore they could not be a part of my life. When all it was really about, of course, was control in the same way that Diddy controlled Cassie's life, if you ask me. So again, I think the people who you can have a relationship with are so, so important. And for me, that was people like you and a few of my other law school classmates. Thank you. Well, okay, but like, let's like dissect this a little bit, right? So like in your situation, you had your own network that you had created, but Cassie moved on with someone who Diddy created. Yeah. yeah. And so like, how long were they sharing how what was she sharing with him and and for how long until she felt safe enough i have no idea if this is true or not but from what i've seen on social media um specifically comments to certain posts it has been alleged that her current husband has said I don't want to say negative things about Diddy because that may not have been what she wanted, but it was obvious that he had animosity towards him before the lawsuit even came about. So I think it was a situation where I could imagine where she was confiding in him about what was going on and he was likely supporting her to get out. And who knows when it became romantic, but at the very least, I'm sure he was a friend and a confidant. Right. And so absolutely. And, and they very, and they moved on quickly, um, which, right. and, and had two babies. Um, yeah. And I just, I have so much compassion because that's really beautiful and really hard for her yeah. to be going through these huge life changes and like moving into motherhood and partnership in this particular way while she's like deep in her trauma. And I think part of that M is because we deny the trauma because we spent so much time denying the abuse. So if you, if you first denied the abuse, how could you then welcome the trauma that stemmed from the abuse? And right. So, it's so you have a dissonance that happens. Like I went through something that was really tough, but I'm fine now. My and I'm gonna have better. a baby. I'm gonna have a second baby. And I'm, I'm gonna, gonna get married. I'm gonna get and married. I, I, I'm gonna keep my career. Yeah, I would never take that from her because if that's what she has wanted independently and took ownership over her life to have. But I know for me, there were times, a lot of time, where I thought I was well and I wasn't. And it also can be both right? Like this can be part of her healing, getting, you know, having a life on her own terms, but that doesn't mean that the harm doesn't stay with you or and come I out in different ways. Yeah. And I hope no one is looking at this situation thinking that either, well, she moved on, she's fine because. So no. I think a lot of people are, <laughs> that's, that's what I wanted to that's get that. at. Right. That people are like, why is she complaining? She's married. She has two beautiful kids. Like, th oh, that's what I think people are thinking and why I, I mean, I just, it's beautiful. And to 
be in that phase of life with so many people needing so much from you and you being so tender must be very challenging. I can imagine. So another thing has happened since we spoke. I mean, I think you called it and unfortunately it's come to pass that other victims um, have come forward. I'm sure this will not be the end of the line of victims um, that have come forward, but one of them um, is a case from 1991 that I want to get your opinion on, M. Yeah. Because this woman says that she met Diddy and he drugged her, took her back. I think it was, well, I know it was Diddy and Aaron Hall, but I think it was she and her friend who were together at some point. And um, they took her home and Diddy and Aaron Hall took turns R wording her. And she's now come forward to tell her story and to seek some compensation for the harm that was done to her. Obviously, Margo, people are saying this happened in 1991. Why now? What's your opinion? So I would say two things. Why not? And I imagine part of it is about the sunsetting of this Adult Survivors Act that she may not be able to file. She may have not been able to file after November 24th. Yeah. Um, there's nothing about that that surprises me. I, I, I am inclined to 100% believe her and stand with her. I think the delay in filing is very common for all the reasons we know, mainly because a lot of people, like you said, Tashira, deny the harm until they can no longer deny it. So maybe... She didn't even come to terms with what happened to her until last year. Absolutely. And we know about repressed memory. We know so much now about the brain and there's so much more to know, but we know a lot about repressed memories. We know a lot about people disassociating. We know a lot about how trauma impacts memory. And so there are so many reasons why someone may not file. And it's not her fault that she was R-worded by two random people. Drugged and R-worded. So I don't care if it's 100 years from when it happened. I want to go back to the specificity that you pointed out because I think that was such a strong counter to the, to the deniers and naysayers. Like, unless... So who would I have to be to come up with these things? So it's the it's the specificity, right? But also, no one wants to do this. That's the part that I just don't understand about people calling people money grubbing hoes. Like, no one wants to be the person sharing what happened to them one night when they were in their twenties, sexually, to, with, with their family, friends, world, like. With all of the stereotypes, all of the slut shaming, everything that women already have to deal with as far as their sexuality is concerned, on top of that, you want to tell people that you were out partying one night and you were drunk. He had every right to party. She had every right to go back to his house. And if she decided she didn't want to have sex, she didn't have to have sex. And that's just the that on that, right? But the facts that lead up to it are enough to make anyone condemn you. And you know that, yet you still come forward. So for me, why would I ever second guess the 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 truth, the the veracity of it? Because you have everything to lose. To you lose. Have you have everything to lose in coming forward with these cases, particularly the civil cases where you're asking for compensation because you know, you know what people are going to say about you, particularly when you're a black woman, particularly when the defendant is a black man, and particularly when that that man is very wealthy. And he targeted women who didn't have any power. Right. So if it were, I don't want to name women, but like if it were a, a, a female celebrity coming forward, I imagine she would be more believed. Well, there's there's one in particular that people are wondering if she will say something. And we know that, for some period of time, he was in relationship with, with Jennifer Lopez. So we don't know. 
So, okay. So I know we're kind of getting a little bit low on time, but there's another element of this that no one's really talked about either um, that I think is interesting. And I did a little research, but I don't know. I don't know everything, but it is clear that Cassie is a woman of color. She is biracial. Um, and she looked a certain way when she was with Diddy and she no longer looks that way. Well, I mean, let's separate these things. Yes. Number one, the person that would make her get breast implants, I'm sure was also very much in control of every way she presented. And so if there was some indication during that time that she looked maybe a little bit more urban, <laughs> it likely was due to her relationship with him. And also I would say her getting into a music industry that caters hip hop, R&B, that caters to a particular audience. But also... I don't want to deny what it means to have been in a relationship with someone who looks and presented a certain way and going the complete opposite direction, whether it be gender, race, socioeconomic status, because there is something that I think our brains associate with that harm and the trauma that may make victims say, I don't want anything ever to do with that again. I did a truck driver. This person was abusive. I will never date another truck driver ever again. That's right? really, that's actually, that's such a good point to share. And it's nothing to do with the person driving trucks, but that's what we begin to convince ourselves. I think there's a, a survival, right? Freeze, flight, fright. They, they, they fight. There is a survival thing that our brains finally like kick into. That maybe is a, a yeah. Bit it's just pressure. really interesting because she looks so different now, almost unrecognizable. She's a beautiful woman. I mean, just like shockingly beautiful. Um, and I mean, I, I, I am learning right. There's like the gift of makeup. There's like all of these things that you can do to present in a certain way. And she was a performer, celebrity. I get it, but it is really interesting how given how much control he had over her life yeah i i wonder how much he forced her to highlight one part of her life over another come on preach this preach this not to mention just the industry as well you know right and like we never saw a photo of her before like without makeup or perfectly outfitted or yeah but let me tell you one thing. A, 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 there is one image of Jennifer Lopez that will be cemented into my brain because I probably tried to replicate this in the early 2000s. The green dress? Oh, no. that Now, that was a moment. But the Versace this, dress? I remember that Versace dress. It was her with that daggone bandana and those pigtails and a crop top and like low, low, low jeans or something she was wearing. Quintessentially hip-hop. It was don't be fooled by da, da 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 da. It was a Jenny from the block days, right? I was a fan. That was the Diddy era. Post Diddy, sis was like, no, thank you. I don't think she had a bandana. I'm dating a white boy from Boston. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? She was like, F a bandana. I don't want no low rise jeans. <laughs> so um, this is all conjecture, but sometimes that math be math in him. I'm just saying. Well, I wonder if she'll say anything. I do. I do. Obviously, we want what is best for her because, as you told me from the beginning, right, is nobody that I don't have to share. Sharing is part of my healing, but that's not everybody's story. But should she feel that she needs to come forward. I know I and other survivors would welcome it. Yeah. And I also wonder what she knew. Because while there probably wasn't overlap necessarily between her and Cassie, J-Lo has revisited loves of her past before. Yeah, this is true. And I just wonder what she knew about what harm was happening. Yeah, or could potentially happen, right? The kind of person that he was then or that he was growing to become. I just think we are seeing, and not just Diddy's case, 
and all of these high profile, powerful abusers, men that we've outlined before on our podcast, it is just such a despicable industry as far as the ways in which men are allowed to blatantly behave and abuse. Um, I just feel like it is an unsafe environment for female body people in so many ways. And I just wonder why no one's asking Tashara, why is it always one way? What do you mean? You never hear about women abusing men in this way. And why aren't more men taking a stand saying, this is unacceptable? Like, we say it all the time, right? Like, it is white people's job to fix white supremacy. It is men's job to fix SA and R work. Like, it is not on the victims, it is not on the people who have been victimized. It is on the assailants and people who are similarly situated. Mm -hmm. I mean, male privilege is a thing. So if you have that male body privilege, then you should also have the responsibility to eradicate the power structures that gave you said privilege. And I would say, just to end my piece on this, that the people around Diddy who allowed this to happen and protected him to keep their paycheck, I think they should be held responsible too. Because we need to incentivize people. While they maybe didn't harm anyone individually they certainly didn't protect when they could they were not intentional bystanders as we would say and we have to incentivize people to do the right thing and help each other not incentivize silence and let me just say this too i mean we don't know obviously the law in every jurisdiction but from my understanding if people are thinking well they sign an nda an nda does not protect you from criminal wrong wrongdoing right so if you believe that something illegal is happening you don't the nda is not going to protect that person you can still go to law enforcement you can oh still- you mean if like a bodyguard has signed an nda exactly as part that, of their that, job not to share what happens but they know that they they subsequently learn of criminal behavior correct like you can break your nda and report a crime Exactly. That's a simple, that's a contract that has nothing to do. And that has to do with like not talking to the media. Exactly. So these people signing NDAs and there's, and, and using that as an excuse. No, ma'am, no, ham, no, turkey. That's, that's not how this thing goes. And, and the power, right. And the power structure exists diddy down, right? So like yeah. understanding that this person has a lot of power in all of these relationships and is controlling all of these pieces to get what he wants, I get it. You're going to lose your job, but you're also going to do the right thing. And that really is what it comes down to, right? Like, what are your convictions as a person? And and that's what one of his staff people took to social media to to talk about this week, that, you know, I have daughters, so I want to say that everything that Cassie has said is true. Well, I I wish that he had a, a, a similar mindset or that mindset when she was actively being abused. Sure. It's like good that they're sharing now to to support Cassie because it's better than not. Yeah. But I don't give those people a lot of credibility right now because they allowed this to happen. That's more than fair. Take take that up with whomever your higher power is. I think that is more than fair. Um, Margo, one of the things that I thought about when we wrapped up the first conversation, and we'll link it down below if folks haven't seen that one, is, well, I'm sure he's not treating Young Miami this way. And for folks who do not know, Young Miami is one half of City Girls. They are a rap duo that hail from Miami 305 and from Florida. So I ride for for, for them really hard. Uh, two young women, Miami's real name is Carisha, and she b- began to get photographed with Diddy, I think, last year. Um, and they have had this kind of playful back and forth in the media. Are they together? Are they not? Um, But it's clear they have some sort of romantic connection. And my thought was, well, I'm sure he's not treating her like that because she's fierce. She's bold. She's a city girl. You know, she's going to tell 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 it how it is in a way that women from a certain class do. And I had to catch myself because I thought to myself, well, someone said that about me. They said I was strong. I was bold. How could you? How, How did you find yourself in that situation? And I just want to underscore that if I felt that way as a survivor, 
how problematic the mindset and how pervasive it has to be. There is no perfect picture of someone who has been victimized. There, there is no prototype all shapes, sizes, hues, and everything in between. And so um, my heart goes out to any woman who has been in relationship with Diddy because we have enough evidence to know that he is not a good person and damn sure not a good partner. And I think that's such a strong and important point because we make assumptions based on so many elements of a person's presentation and their character And we just don't know. Right. And he's lucky to be with her. Right. She's the star. Girl. Who was checking for Diddy? I think the current media attention that he has and this album that he either is releasing or has released, who who cares? Who knows what's checking for his music? Um, It's all because of him. Like, she's brought him back into the pop culture narrative. And I'm sure because of his money and the fame, he has likely convinced her and those around her that he's the prize. And it is most definitely the other way around. As it typically is, I I think my abuser often did things to try to dampen my shine because he saw me for who I was before I did. Yeah. And objectively, you know, he had nothing compared to you. The girl, not a thing. (laughs) Okay, you all stay tuned. We will be here for these mini episodes as other things begin to develop. Let us know down in the comments if you have a show topic or idea or a current event that you want us to chime in on. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye.